Hello Aviator, Sky here, and after a long time walking around, we finally come to the most famous rear-engined quad layout airliner, which honestly can be called one of the best civilian aircraft of its time, and one of the best, if not the best, Soviet civilian airliner in general. Some people will be surprised. Seriously, the best? We're back in the Central Air Force Museum, and here, in a radius of 100 meters, there are at least the 2144 and 2114, the real titans of their time, and I'm… singing praises to Lucian. Let's figure out what makes me think so. Allow me to introduce. Ilyushin Il-62 is a narrow-body, long-haul passenger aircraft developed by the Ilyushin Design Bureau in the early 1960s. It is the first Soviet long-range jet airliner and one of the trinity of aircraft in the world that implemented a scheme with four engines on a tail. So, it is the end of the 1950s. Khrushchev and Eisenhower are playing the Cold War, the first satellites are being launched into the Earth orbit, the French upgrade their republic to the fifth version, Elvis Presley sings and hydrogen bombs explode. You know, a normal civilized life. There was also a huge number of aviation events. The advent of gas turbine power plants significantly increased the power of engines on aircraft, which learned to fly faster and higher, becoming at the same time bigger. A class of long-haul airliners capable of transporting many people over long distances started to emerge. Different manufacturers were taking different paths. Boeing and Douglas spent a lot of time making their flagships, but the models 707 and DC-8, appearing in the late 1950s, became extremely successful. The British were fighting for leadership and connecting the colonies, so since the 1950s they began work on a new large jet airliner, which later turned into the Vickers VC-10. In the Soviet Union, the situation was in many ways similar, but also had differences. The huge size of the country made the need for long-distance flights obvious. In addition, the number of allies around the world with whom it was necessary to establish contact was growing. And the contact was established by creating the first Soviet long-range aircraft, Tu-114. The Tu-114 was a real king of airliners. Advanced technology, powerful turboprop engines, luxurious interior, beautiful, not to mention the size and weight, records broken only with the arrival of the Queen. In addition, the affinity with the 295 bomber and the corresponding design gave the aircraft a special charisma. The Soviet airliner was very different from its foreign counterparts. However, this charisma was expensive. The 2114 was a response to an urgent need for a long-haul airliner and a demonstration of capabilities of the Soviet aircraft industry. But for mass operation it was complicated and expensive. Many of its smart solutions were not particularly needed. The capacity at such a size was small, and the turboprop power plant, despite its record performance, was nevertheless outdated. The plane was not fast enough and too noisy. Already at the initial stages of operation in the late 1950s, it became clear that with all its advantages, this plane would not become a mass transport for a long perspective. Ok, maybe not the 2114, but the long-range transport is still needed. It was necessary to make a new plane. The obvious idea to give it to Tupolev wouldn't work. At that time they were loaded with military contracts, plus still working on the 2114, plus they were engaged in several other civilian projects, firstly the new original jet, the future 2134. They simply didn't have the resources to deal with another large airliner. The implementation of the project in 1960 was entrusted to the Illusion Design Bureau, and this was an excellent solution. Ilyushin's approach to civilian aircraft design, unlike most of his very ambitious colleagues, was very pragmatic. He was creating exactly what was needed, without chasing a special wow effect. The realization of this approach then was the Il-18, a rather reliable, comfortable and simple aircraft for its time, which was loved both by the passengers and operators. Hundreds of delivered vehicles were a clear proof of this. Choosing a power plant was not particularly an issue. It had to be the jet engines. The turboprop was good in many roles, but it could not pull the long-range civilian transportation. In addition, the engine building industry was very successful, and the roaring barrels became quite effective. The next issue was the layout, and here usually begins the speculation on similarity of the Il-62 and the VC-10. On the one hand, the idea of copying seems obvious. The British plane had been developing for several years, and there was enough noise around their projects to be heard in the offices of Soviet engineers. 
On the other hand, this similarity is rather the result of similarity of technical tasks. Both airliners were created to transport a decent number of passengers over long distances. And while being large machines, they had to be able to work with poor quality airfields. At the same time, both aircraft had to have four engines. So there was not a lot of options. As a result, scientists from Tsagi and the Royal Aviation Institute came to the same layout. Meanwhile, given the similarity in concepts, we have a great opportunity to compare how British and Soviet aviators approached almost identical tasks. With all the external similarities, the Il-62 and VC-10 in fact do not have much in common. The story of the Il-62 will be more clear if the broadcast will be conducted directly from it. To do this, as always, we visit the Central Air Force Museum in Monino, near Moscow, where we meet one of the representatives of our protagonist family, the USSR 86670, an early serious aircraft, an air flight veteran, and now also a movie star. We begin our acquaintance with the rich inner world of this miracle. The fuselage of the aircraft has a width of 3.75 meters, 12.3 feet, and a length of 49 meters, 160 feet. According to these indicators, it is a quite classic narrow-body long-haul airliner of its time, not particularly different from Pierce. Let's take a look at what's inside. Usually people get on board through the front doors, where they immediately get access to the wardrobe, the cockpit, the first cabin, and two lavatories. The interior layout is also classic, 3 plus 3 with one aisle. Everything is done as practical as possible, no complicated layouts and designs. Compared to the 2114, super aesthetic, but by modern standards quite usual. Fabric seats with tables and nets for small items, individual comfort tools above, luggage beans. Perhaps the translucent window curtains are a bit unusual. Here I'll immediately note that our plane is special. The board 86670, assembled in 1967, is one of the earliest production aircraft of this model, so it has features that are absent on its later brothers. This can even be seen by the capacity of the cabin. There are fewer seats here than on the airs. Their front cabins accommodated up to 66 people, and later even more. The cabin, by the way, through the efforts of the museum and volunteers, is preserved in an excellent condition. The cozy Soviet authenticity was appreciated by filmmakers. This airliner sometimes turns into a movie set. Behind the first cabin there is another set of auxiliary zones. Buffets, wardrobe, lavatory and the second pair of doors. This arrangement allows to quickly move passengers into both cabins, since there was no place in the tail for another door. The working area for the cabin crew on board is classic, but some solutions are quite elegant. Plus, among the tools we can find interesting manuals for crew members. And of course, in addition to the lamps, a couple of small roof windows fill the galley with light. Looks pretty. The second cabin, in basic configuration, is designed for 102 passengers. The layout is the same as that of the first, and the bigger capacity is achieved by the bigger length. Visually, the cabins differ by the seats and curtain colors. An unusual customization. The first cabin is filled with blue light, while the second one is orange. There are lavatories and a wardrobe located in the rear of the fuselage. There's actually a lot of space here, but they did not stretch the cabin. Since the engines are located here, most of the noise and vibration is in this place. Plus, part of the space is occupied by the power plant and control equipment. In addition to four engines, we also have a tail above our heads. There is another interesting drive here, but we will return to it a bit later. In the basic configuration, the Il-62 accommodated 168 passengers in two cabins, and 138 in three. And this fact, oddly enough, is one of the main differences between Ilyushin and Vickers. The fact is that the British plane initially was not supposed to accommodate a lot of people. Its maximum capacity reached 151 people in a dense layout. This way, BOAC divided VC-10 and Boeing 707 in their fleet. The Soviet aircraft was originally being made as a large-capacity airliner, so here it is more adequate to compare it with Boeing and Douglas, not with Vickers. The advantage of this solution was not only the initially decent capacity, but also the potential. During modernization it was increased to 186, and then up to 196 passengers without lengthening the fuselage, which greatly simplified the work. Now we can run to the nose and get into the very brain of any aircraft. 
The IL-62 cockpit is a combination of the latest technology of its time and healthy conservatism. The engineers had to give the airliner all the necessary capabilities and at the same time not make it too complex. As practice shows, this is not so simple. Flight operation is performed by a crew of five people. Two pilots, an engineer, a navigator and a radio operator. Such a team was a conservative solution. The illusions didn't complicate the electronics in order to reduce the crew. Nevertheless, the control system of the aircraft was very modern. A significant part of the system, primarily automation, were either completely new or modernized. Meanwhile, the critical elements were reserved. The idea of making the aircraft efficient and at the same time as simple as possible spread further. One of the problems of many large aircraft was the high load on the pilots, physical. It was easy to drive a little Cessna without any support from hydraulics and boosters, but when your plane is already the size of the house, it doesn't work. On the other hand, the simplification of piloting with technology also has a price. The aircraft has to be packed with a huge amount of equipment that requires maintenance and makes the plane heavier. The VC-10 in this case was an extreme design. It was easily controlled, but turned out to be terribly complicated. Dilution went the other way. The engineers tried to assemble the aircraft in such a way as to minimize the number of supplements, which was also a walk on the edge. The IL-62 is the largest civilian aircraft in the world with minimal controls, almost without boosters. Nevertheless, they did not fall over the edge. The plane still obeyed its pilots. In addition, many of the advantages of Illusion's airliners remained in place. The cockpit is quite spacious, ergonomics is good for its time, and the view is also good. The plane of course received the traditional for Illusion glazing. You can immediately tell who made this masterpiece. Well, it's time to look at this beauty from the outside. The IL-62 is a large single-aisle airliner, has a swept low wing and is equipped with four engines in the tail section, right next to the T-shaped plumage. The total length of the aircraft slightly exceeds 53 meters, 174 feet. The location of the engines on the tail allows to develop a clean and aerodynamically effective wing. It is large enough to support flights at high and low speeds. And then the nuances begin. The rear part of the wing has a fairly simple mechanization. Two large sections of retractable flaps, ailerons and spoilers, also a pair on each side. I especially emphasize the simplicity of this scheme. In comparison with what was built on the VC-10, the IL-62 is very minimalistic. And this is at the trailing edge. Let's go ahead and look at the leading edge. If you look closely, you can notice that there are no slats. The decision to abandon the hefty mechanism on the wing allows to decently simplify the design, reduce its weight and increase the internal volume for the fuel tanks. Not only Illusion liked this design, attentive viewers of the channel could notice not one of the Gulfstream aircraft, even their latest models, has slats, for the same reasons. But unlike the small and electronically packed business jets, the huge IL-62 could not work without help, and as a result of engineers work came a very elegant solution. At the leading edge there is a small protrusion resembling a tooth. It has almost no effect on aerodynamics during horizontal cruise flight, but with an increase in the angle of attack it creates a vortex that stabilizes the airflow around the wing. This allows the aircraft to not be afraid of turbulence and high angles of attack, and reduces the minimum flight speed on takeoffs and landings. Don't forget about the weak and short airstrips. The combination of this element with a special wing design became a serious challenge for engineers and required a lot of work, both in wind tunnels and in production. A slightest deviation from required parameters and this tooth could become useless. However, the successful implementation of this idea gave the aircraft good flight performance without the use of complex schemes. The embodiment of the idea of design simplicity and, indeed, the great success of Illusions Bureau. The landing gear is quite classic, tricycle. Two-wheel front leg and four-wheel bogies of the main support. The legs are short, which puts the aircraft close to the ground, but reduces lateral overloads during takeoffs and landings. And the wheels are quite large with reduced pressure, softening the bumps on the runway. The whole team, of course, is equipped with powerful brakes. The operation proved the efficiency of the landing gear and its reliability. The aircraft worked normally in many airports and sometimes made landings on grass runways. Once, by the way, right here in the museum. In addition, to provide deceleration after landing, the pilots could use the Cobra maneuver. After landing, they lifted the aircraft nose and used the whole plane as an aerodynamic brake. 
The main gear steadily endured this mockery, and the danger was mainly in the risk of hitting the runway with the tail. There is another non-obvious but successful solution. The fact is that the landing gear is not really tricycle. The nuance of the aircraft with tail engines is their tendency to lean back. The tail structure with heavy motors simply outweighs the nose. This phenomenon was fought in different ways, and at the Illusion they made the simplest decision. To put another small leg that would support this excess weight. Many critics of the plane dismissively call this support a crutch. Vickers, for example, worked without it, making the most obvious decision. To compensate the mass in the tail, the aircraft received a fuselage elongated forward, and the center of mass was exactly above the wing and landing gear. It seemed okay. The problem with this arrangement was that all control surfaces ended up in the rear, close to each other. Such a scheme cut the lever of the tail force, which required an increase in the size of the plumage and the installation of a huge stabilizer with boosted support. Illusion went the other way. They shifted the wing slightly forward, increasing the lever and simplifying control, which allowed to abandon the too complex mechanization and large boosted stabilizers. But the solution also had a price. The center of mass was behind the main landing gear. Without fuel and cargo in front, the plane was falling on its tail. And here comes the crutch. This quite simple leg slides out of the fuselage and supports the plane on the ground. And after retraction, the wheels remain partially outside as an insurance against the tail strike. The leg is controlled remotely from the cockpit, or if necessary, yes. In the technical compartment and the tail, there is a direct access to the drive, and the leg could be controlled manually. A pretty simple design, which nevertheless gave better controllability and at the same time allowed to abandon a bunch of extra elements. So with this metal stick, the engineers bought the simplification of design and a decent weight reduction. Not a bad deal, if you ask me. Finally, it's time to get acquainted with the power plant. The basic IL-62 was lifted by the NK-8 turbofans, creating thrust of up to 102 kN. Initially, they were created specifically for the IL-62, but later were installed on the 2154. Engines are installed in pairs in individual nacelles. This layout made it possible to create a clean wing, the high location ensured against foreign debris, and the placement in individual nacelles reduced the level of vibration and noise. Plus, four engines gave a reserve of thrust, and the proximity of the motors to the central axis increased safety. In the case of failures, the aircraft would not start to turn, and could maintain a stable flight. In addition, the IL-62 was the first in the country to receive thrust reversal mechanisms. Such mechanisms make it possible to redirect the thrust forward after landing and decelerate more efficiently on the runway. However, the crews also found other roles for this system. Like the quite obvious, the reversers located on the tail allow the aircraft to move backwards independently, as well as the somewhat extreme ones, such as applying the reversers before touching the ground. The mechanisms are installed on the two outside engines. As practice has shown, this was enough for braking speed. So, the work reached the finish line in 1963. The first prototype was ready, but the engines couldn't make it in time. Since most of the flight tests involved checking the capabilities of the airframe and onboard systems, to speed up the work it was decided to put the AL-7, not a bad engine, used on several military aircraft. For such a colossus as the IL-62 it was of course pretty weak, but for the initial stage of testing it should have been enough. Finally, the prototype made its maiden flight in January 1963. The tests were carried out at an active pace, and soon two more planes joined the first board, already with the NK-8 engines installed. Airplanes showed themselves pretty good. They flew at a cruising speed of 850 km per hour, or 530 miles per hour, at altitudes of up to 12,000 meters, or 39,000 feet. Not record numbers, of course, but quite enough for civilian use. The design also showed itself well. The many risky solutions were successful, and the aircraft did not require major changes. Unfortunately, the tests did not go as smoothly as planned. In February 1965, during another test, the first prototype was unable to rise on takeoff and fell near the Ramenskaya airfield. The problem turned out to be in the engines. The AL-7 couldn't pull the plane at the maximum modes. Due to this disaster, the tests were put on hold, but given that the other prototypes had other engine models, after the investigation and adjusting the work plan, testing was resumed. The tests were completed in 1967, and the aircraft started passenger flights. 
Aeroflot finally got its main long-range airliner. However, it turned out to be insufficiently long-range. The basic NK-8-2 engines couldn't give enough thrust. With normal passenger load, it had to fly with a reduced fuel reserve, which reduced flight range. Soon, the aircraft received the boosted NK-8-4 engines, and the performance improved. But it was not possible to completely solve the problem. The aircraft was too heavy, fuel consumption was too high. On long-distance routes, it still had to land for refueling, which complicated the operation. In addition, the Il-62 was planned by Aeroflot as a replacement for the Tu-114, but the range for this was still not enough. The complete solution was the creation of the Il-62M. The main difference from the basic aircraft was the replacement of the NK-8 engines with the new D-30KU. These engines reached nearly 108 kN of thrust, which allowed to increase cruise speed, reduce takeoff and landing distance, as well as improve flight capabilities in conditions of heat and high-altitude airports. The clamshell reverse system gave way to bucket type. The doors were more efficient, and in flight, the lattice increased air resistance. The aircraft itself got heavier, its capacity increased to 186 passengers, and an additional fuel tank appeared inside the vertical stabilizer. The increase in fuel reserve, coupled with better engine efficiency, as well as a number of improvements of the airframe and onboard systems, gave results. The aircraft was able to fly almost 11,000 kilometers, or 5,900 miles. This was enough to cover all the needs of air travel. The Lucian Bureau was working on the Model M long and hard, so it took almost five years since the start of work to commissioning. The aircraft began flying in air flats since 1974. The Il-62M had become a truly successful aircraft, the pride of designers and a workhorse on long-range routes. The decisions made on the creation of this aircraft turned out to be successful. The rejection of many complex onboard systems made the aircraft simple and cheap to operate, and the optimization of design minimized the scourge of aircraft of this layout. Increased weight. Having retained excellent takeoff and landing performance, the 60-second turned out to be relatively light. The empty weight of the airliner was similar to the VC-10, despite the fact that the Illusion was larger and more spacious. It was still heavier than the American airliners, but with their layout, the Boeing 707 and Douglas DC-8 were more demanding on airfields and did not meet operating conditions. All these indicators made the aircraft extremely popular. It was produced for a very long time, until 1995. During this time, 289 units were delivered. For a model of this size in the USSR, this was an impressive figure. With the appearance of the M version, Il-62 completely replaced the Tu-114 and remained the flagship long-haul airliner until the appearance of the Il-96. Also, all this time it was the main government board, which again was replaced only by the new 96th. In addition, dozens of airliners have been exported to several countries in Eastern Europe, to Cuba, China, North Korea and Africa. For some time, the planes were even shared by Aeroflot, Air France and KLM, which were then separate from each other, as well as the Japanese JAL. Joint flights were carried out mainly to Moscow. In total, in various incidents and disasters, 23 airliners were lost, with the death of about 1,000 people. These figures are rather unpleasant, but it is worth considering the huge volume of traffic that a fairly large number of aircraft of this model took over. So the 62nd, of course, is not the ultimate dream in terms of flight safety, but for its time it was at the level of classmates and was considered quite reliable. The Il-62 was loved by all the people connected with it. Becoming a mass-delivered airliner, it allowed millions of people to comfortably travel through distances, making our world a little more accessible. Minimalism and the lack of pretentiousness in its creation became one of its main advantages, and the main difference from the Vickers airliner, as well as many Soviet counterparts. While the VC-10 was considered the vanguard of aviation industry, like the planes developed for example by Tupolev, the Il-62 was exactly what was needed. No more and no less. As a result, it turned out to be simpler, cheaper and more efficient. Illusion engineers could easily compare their aircraft with peers. The Il-62 was undeniably good. Alas, time is a harsh and indomitable thing, and the aviation technology race does not slow down. Appearing in the 1960s, the airliner showed itself perfectly, and most of its shortcomings were resolved by creating the version M. However, despite the correctly made decisions, the version M was late. The era of wide-body airliners began. 
In 1974, when Airflot took the IL-62M into operation, giants like the Boeing 747, Douglas DC-10, Lockheed L-1011 and Airbus A300 were already soaring over the world, which greatly cut the competitiveness of the aircraft on the international market. The IL-62 could be compared with the VC-10, Boeing 707 or DC-8, but with the new wide-body Long Rangers, no. Inside the USSR, in the conditions of a neat distribution of roles in the Airflot fleet model line, the aircraft felt excellent for a long time. But even there, over time, it started to become obsolete. The engines were not economical and noisy, the capacity at this range was small, and the excellent takeoff and landing performance often turned out to be unnecessary. The plane had to be replaced, and the IL-96 was created for this, but it was replaced by others. With the collapse of the USSR and the global market opening, foreign long-haul airliners arrived to Russia and the CIS. The obsolete IL-62 could not compete with them, and the IL-96 that was created to replace it was too late and could not fill the gap fast enough. In the 1990s and 2000s, the aircraft were quickly withdrawn from the airline fleets. Some of the planes with sufficient flying resources were converted into cargo aircraft, a classic solution for large passenger airliners, although it did not become especially popular for the Model 62. In 2019, a little more than a dozen aircraft continued to operate, mainly in government structures. The vast majority of non-flying aircraft was disposed of, but some were fortunate enough to be parked in museums. Our airliner with the number USSR 86670 is the 10th series board of the IL-62 model, one of the basic ones. It was assembled in 1967 and operated in the Airflot fleet until 1983. On July 17, the aircraft made a successful landing on the grass runway of the Monino airfield, showing that even such conditions, although being unusual, are not terrible for it. The airliner drove to its place and stayed where, over time, it became the star of many films and the hero of some aviation fans' videos. On this, I think we can finish today's story. Like the video and subscribe to the channel. Fast flights and soft landings to you.